it's hard for me not to just fanboy over over bopping because I love who he is and what he does. But this is a guy who can write reform dogmatics and then a bunch of essays on uh, all sorts of stuff, ethical ethical issues and such, as well as being like involved in like papers, like uh, newspapers and stuff like that, and being uh, uh, Kuiper's theological henchman and like he could do all this stuff. But then he was also jumping in on this and instead of saying this kernel stuff is not religious this finding the kernel the essence of christianity no no no. what you need is the dogmatics read my whole thing he's like i'll do that too i'll jump in on that project as well as making my own dogmatics as well as doing this as well as teaching at every level that's what i love i want more people like that you know who aren't just (laughs) fighting over no don't make it too simple or don't make it too heady like let's do it all every level let's hit them all Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedicase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is another very special one. We're going to be talking a little bit more about theology today, uh, and especially the theology of uh, dogmatician Herman Bavink, Bavink, however you say it. Um, And I have with me Greg Parker. And uh, Greg's assistant professor of theology at Karen University, I believe, and uh, we'll be defending his dissertation here soon. I'm really excited for this. It's been a long time coming, but I finally got him on. I'm 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 stoked to get back into some Bob Inc. and Dutch theology type stuff. Um, this is Theophilus. If if for those who are watching, Theophilus is the most excellent puppy. But today, this morning, he was not so excellent. He got into uh, one of my. He got into my wife's unmentionables. I'll say. And I may have had to take him to the vet at like 7.30 in the morning. So he's not doing too hot right now. Usually you see him, you know, <laughs> biting and stuff. But so uh, if he is making noises and stuff, that's what's up. Poor little Theophilus is still on the mend. But uh, you can get uh, some Parker's Pensies gear now, like a lot of gear over at my Teespring store. You can find the link in the description. And we got some designs with most excellent Theophilus coming through. So stay tuned for those. If you love this podcast, if you like this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can support this podcast for anything as uh, as little as three dollars a month, all the way up to a hundred. And uh, another way to support this podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, there should be a super thanks button down here. You can give me a tip. You can buy me a coffee, whatever uh, you want to do above and beyond. So thanks for supporting this podcast. Leave us some comments. Give it a like. You know how to manipulate the algorithms but uh, if you do leave comments uh i will still read through those until we get too huge and you guys get too crazy so without further ado let's bring in greg and let's talk about the theology of herman bovink <clears throat> greg man i always say bovink I, I think i'm just i think i'm settled on it i know it's probably like bavink or something what, what, what do you say how do you pronounce it i say it the way that you said uh herman nice. bovink uh, so I wouldn't sweat it too much. Uh, we can start our own little coalition and yeah. and make that the right reading if we want. Uh, but thanks so much for having me on, Parker. Uh, yeah. It's it's going to take me a, a, a bit to get used to calling you Parker. Uh, <laughs> when I was growing up, uh, I was always called by my last name. Mm-hmm. And so it almost feels like I'm, I'm talking to some sort of version of myself right now. I love that, dude. Um, yeah. So. I can resonate with that. People would always <laughs> would always be like, hey, Parker, what's your first name? And be like, yeah, no, that's that is my first name. And people are like, you have yeah. two last names. I'm like, yeah, sorry, man. I didn't <laughs> name myself. Um, yep. Yeah, there, but, was, uh, there was one there was one family that would always call me Parker Parker, my older sister Parker, and then my younger brother Parker Parker Parker. Uh <laughs> So it's there's all all kinds of different ways to approach this this being a Parker. That's right. Do you do you know? I was going to say, do you know what it means? Do you know what Parker means? I don't. I, I assume that it had some sort of uh, reference to like keeping a land or something in in English yeah. nobility or something like that. But do yeah, you know? like yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I've heard is that it's, it's someone who like manages and keeps the parks. Okay. Like that's that's yeah. not bad, dude. I like that. I like animals and yeah. stuff. I could go with that. Yeah, yeah. I could get down <clears> with that. Yeah. Um, well, dude, so, so you're, you're part of the, the, uh, Bob Inc. It's the reformation. I've, I've called it like revolution before. And the other guys are like, no, dude, it's, we don't go in for revolutions. We go in for reformation. <laughs> so, uh, you're, uh, can you tell us a little bit, like, how'd you get into studying Bob Inc. and where, where are you studying him? I guess. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I started reading, um, 
Bob Inc. in about, I guess, 2014, I had just finished up my undergraduate work and I uh, was working at an Amazon warehouse and there was this little reformed bookstore like two blocks from my house. Super dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so uh, every this time like I was Michigan get, or something, where, where was uh, so this was in like central PA, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Oh, OK, PA, and so uh, uh, where the banner of truth is located, nice. uh, or at least their English location. And so every time I get paid, I kind of stumble down the street into this bookstore and, and buy something. Uh, and across a few paychecks, I ended up picking up Bob Inks Reform Dogmatics uh, really as a way to try to bolster my my theological, I guess, acumen. Um, cause alongside of being at Amazon, I was kind of helping in this church plant and I really felt like I just, I needed more theology. Uh, so that was when I first started reading Bob Inc. Um, but it wasn't really until seminary, uh, I went up to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, their, their South Hamilton campus, which is being mm. closed. Um, and really uh, kind of forced or strong armed a couple of professors there to let me do some independent studies kind of oriented towards Bob Inc. And so that was when I really, I guess, joined, uh, the the fledgling reformation and then uh which was already really started because uh, Corey brock and grace utanto and, and and james bruce pass cam and all those guys were already in edinburgh doing uh phenomenal work um so got into bob Vink, it then really got seriously in seminary i uh, did a thm on his doctrine of divine simplicity and then uh, in the midst of that uh gray really uh, encouraged me to consider doctoral work. And uh, so I thought about doing that and kind of looking at pastoral ministry and this kind of pastor theologian model and kind of really fell in love with the idea of doing a PhD, hmm. uh, a very dangerous thing That's <laughs> for right. a seminary student. Um, but then, yeah, it all kind of just came together and I uh, was able to get a scholarship to go to Edinburgh and started working with James and uh, got connected to the, I guess that's Tim Keller calls us the, the Bob Inc. Mafia. Um, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> so I'm working with uh, James Eglinton at Edinburgh. Uh, <clears throat> the project that I ended up kind of settling on was uh, the relationship between Bob Inc.'s dogmatics and his ethics. Yeah. Uh, so kind of, I guess, a timely project given um, all the English translations that have come out in the last decade. I remember talking with you about this a couple of years back when we were on the underground uh, online seminary where mm -hmm. when Paul Maxwell was still Paul Maxwell and not this yeah. shadowy character. I love you, Paul. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, back in those days, that was when they, they started coming out with the uh, Bob Inc. ethics. I remember mm -hmm. asking you like, bro, is this good? Like, is, and you were like tearing mm -hmm. your hair out. Like they, they probably shouldn't <laughs> have done this. Like, yeah, it real quick. Yes. Like it, it's, it's not like his, his um, it's not like the dogmatics where he like spent years and years working on it. It's like something, wasn't it like a project he gave up on or he didn't quite complete? Yeah, that, that's a that's a good way to put it. Uh, so uh, in Compen, um, the theological school of Compen, uh, back in the, the 20th century or turn of the 20th century uh, or before, just right before then, uh, you would teach dogmatics kind of alongside ethics. And so he was kind of always working on these these manuscripts at the same time to some degree. Uh, but his dogmatics, he really polished and worked toward uh, publication. Um, but his ethics, uh, once he switched over to the free university, um, he kind of just stopped working on. And you can kind of tell that they're an earlier version of Bob Inc., um, mm. not as mature thinking. It's a lot more um, kind of like scrib notes almost. Uh, yeah. and so, so that's really my difficulty with the reformed ethics, not to, to slam it. I've, I've read um, what's available. And uh, it's it's just unpolished and unfinished. So we just need to kind of treat it as that. Uh, yeah. I get weary when people talk about his reformed ethics as if it's like the the definitive statement in reformed ethics. You know, there's you know we we don't need to look back or look forward at all anymore, right? We have yeah. it now. Yeah. Uh, and and he wasn't happy with it in that sort of way. So so neither should we. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do yet in in reformed ethics and especially. Uh, looking into Bob Inc.'s ethics, but it is a really inter interesting piece of scholarship because it does give us insight into development within, within Bob Inc.'s thinking. Hmm. Um, and it is a, a huge, uh, just kind of access treasure trove of like, what, what did he think on these things? Um, yeah. but I, I'm not in love with the, the English edition of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's so good. I, I love that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this, 
I don't know how intentional this is, but all the Bavink Mafia, uh, I won't say uh, Bavink Bros, because that's <laughs> not right, and ladies are more than welcome to work uh, with Eglinton. Mm. Uh, but <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, probably. Uh, I love that you guys are picking different topics and like just running through his thoughts. Is that intentional? Does Does James have this master plan, James Eglinton, <laughs> for those who don't know, to say, like, well, I'm going to send Greg out on ethics, because it seems like it's falling out that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, if he has a, a master plan, you know, if he's uh, Magneto or something standing behind the scenes organizing things, uh, he, cer- he certainly hasn't let us in on it. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's just kind of the, the natural development of scholarship uh, that uh, you have all these guys who are interested in Bob Bank uh, and, and girls outside of Edinburgh. Um, yeah. Who uh, just kind of are seeing, you know, holes or seeing opportunities to do uh, interesting scholarship, and so there is some overlap. You know, there's a lot of thinking about this organic motif idea, uh, and you know, maybe maybe too much. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> and there is like a, there's some overlap between my project and and Israel Guerrero's because we both have some some stuff on on faith, uh, and so there is some overlap which is going to happen just because that's naturally scholarship needs to be in conversation with one another um but I th- yeah i think it's just the natural development of a field you know we haven't gotten to the point where like bart studies is where you know people are picking one word to look at uh, uh, yeah. so it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's still pretty interesting <laughs> yeah yeah that's good and uh, i would say bart <clears throat> is no i won't say anything because i have bart listeners but i don't like bart <clears throat> um so yeah, maybe we should just say who who Herman Bavink is for the listeners. Um, I the podcast has taken like a, a sharp the, uh, philosophy of religion type turn, mostly because I, I picked up that degree after Ted's, um, mm-hmm. and so some of my listeners won't even know like who who we're talking about at all. Who who is Herman Bavink and like why, especially if they're philosophy of religion folks, they're like why should we care what this guy thought? Yeah, yeah. So uh, so. Herman was a, a Dutch Reformed theologian. Uh, he really was the progenitor of a uh, an enclave within Reformed theology called Neo-Calvinism alongside of Abraham Kuyper. Uh, he lived from 1854 to 1921, so really spanned uh, a, a good portion of the long 19th century. Um, he's a, a pretty interesting thinker in that uh, he's, he's a as James has put, he's a polymath, or you might want to differently put, it, he's a centrifugal or centripetal scholar, and that mm. he's really interested in kind of seeing all these different fields of knowledge and desiring to connect them in a theological way, and uh, which is kind of part of, I guess, um, my dissertation. I looked at something called the Theological Encyclopedia in uh, in Herman Bavink, which sounds like dreadfully boring um but it was actually really (laughs) exciting and interesting to me but part of the theological encyclopedia is kind of this uh, or i guess encyclopedia in general as a a science of the 19th century is kind of a a looking at all the different fields and trying to map them and talk about how they connect with each other so this kind of gets into some of his uh, organicism right Mm. seeing that all fields of knowledge are connected didn't Um, kuiper have one too Did, did kuiper have an encyclopedia Yep. Yeah. So he okay. had an encyclopedia and the, the English edition is only one volume, but it's, it is a three volume set, the, okay. the Dutch version. Uh, and, and Bavink and Kuiper kind of have different approaches to the encyclopedia. <clears throat> okay. Um, at one point I had a, a, a conference paper that got canceled because of COVID uh, oh, man. titled uh, one, uh, one neo-Calvinist encyclopedia to rule them all. <laughs> kind of playing on Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's um, good. But so Bavink was this this figure who kind of came to um, uh, to prominence in, in Dutch society uh, in the midst of a, a really interesting transition uh, where Dutch society was pretty, um, you might say, like almost like a class system in some way. Um, mm. But Dutch politics really changed over and you had this ability to really integrate into society for these particularly um, Dutch Christians or Dutch seceder Christians. And uh, and so Bob Inc. really uh, took advantage of that and uh, became this kind of world renowned uh, theologian. Um, he's probably most interesting to people within the reformed world. Um, and then particularly Americans have some sort of uh, proclivity towards him. But there is a booming uh, scholarship on him in, in Korea as well. 
Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, dang, that's huge. Um, well, I, I, I don't want to forget. There's so many things I want to talk to you about, but I don't want to forget to uh, to hawk your book here, one of your new books. I didn't actually know there was two. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, but you, so part of the Bob Inc. Mafia is uh, new translations of his book, of his books, and some <laughs> it's not even new. It's just the first English translation. Uh, like so Christian worldview was a, a huge one. Like I, this is one of my favorite books. I love this book. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Jordan Singer works at Crossway. He did the cover for it too. So it's like oh, really nice. special, special to me. He did mm -hmm. my logo. So anyone seeing the Parker Spencer's same guy That's who did great. that, did this. Um, and then you came out with recently Herman Bovink's what is Christianity? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is huge, man. This is so, like, you know, theological Dutch. That's, that's wild. <laughs> Do you ever think you'd be able to say that growing up? Like, yeah, I'm, an expert in theological Dutch. I don't. I don't think it. Uh, it crossed my mind was that when I was growing up. I was <laughs> one of the. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from and and reside now, uh, there's a strong contingent of what you would call Pennsylvania Dutch, yeah. which are is really just Germans, German right? immigrants who kind of settled in the area. It's uh, my wife's family. They're all Pennsylvania. Oh, Dutch. nice. They, they speak. Uh, her, her grandpa like spoke Pennsylvania Dutch as wild. That's awesome. Yeah. So that same with kind of the. Uh, my family. Hmm. And uh, so growing up, you know, a lot of people take like Spanish or something as a second language. But in my area, German was an offering. And so okay. I took German, uh, which is has some sort of a, you know, historical and linguistic uh, connection with Dutch. Um, so I, I guess I had more envisioned doing something maybe with German rather than Dutch. Yeah. Uh, but these are the cards. <laughs> it's so good. I sometimes, uh, so I, I, I did two masters in in theology at TEDS, working another in philosophy of religion, uh, at PBA. And people say like, why, why don't you just go on and do a, a PhD in theology? And I don't think they know that. Like, look, I'm not in a PhD program yet for philosophy. I'm sure it's gonna be really hard to get into and stuff. But once mm -hmm. you get in, I have to do like logic, and that's cool. But I don't have to do uh, French or you know theological French <laughs> or German or Dutch, and then take right. language tests on Hebrew and uh, and Greek. So like it's a little bit less, you know, it's, it's, that's why I'm, I'm trying to go philosophy. Theology is really hard. Um, <laughs> did you have to do rigorous in its own way? Yeah. Did, did, uh, I don't know how the like European systems are. Did you have to do yeah. like, did you have to have a Hebrew and Greek requirement coming in? Uh, so for the UK system, you don't have competency exams. Um, okay. but in terms of getting into the program, they do want you to show some sort of competency. Uh, so I took, theological German at Gordon Conwell as a kind of a way to demonstrate a language. And then uh, James runs a, a really a Dutch translation, uh, learning Dutch, Dutch grammar uh, course okay. your first couple of years uh, in Edinburgh. And so I, I took that alongside of James and that was kind of um, like, you have to agree to do that. Uh, oh, okay. That makes the sense. Program. Uh, they Part of the mafia. They won't really let you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, do you ever get to speak Dutch with anyone? So it's one of the strange things about, uh, I think, maybe just learning theological languages in general. Yeah. Uh, it's that because I learned Greek and then Hebrew, uh, which, which neither of them to me were spoken languages, right? You're just kind of learning how to translate, learning how right. to parse things. Um, when I learned Dutch, I didn't really learn to speak it. Uh, so I, I tried when I was in the Netherlands, I did like a, a month long fellowship and went over there a couple of times to visit, uh, the Herman Bovink archives at the Vrij Universiteit of, uh, Amsterdam. Um, and I try to, you know, converse with people. Um, but one of the strange difficulties is that the Dutch language went through, uh, significant changes in the 1940s, hmm. uh, really sort of to anglicize following, uh, the devastation of world war one and world war two. Um, and kind of, you know, de-Germanify, if I can say that, oh, uh, wow. the I language. Didn't think about that. Wow. Um, and so the the Dutch I was trying to speak, you know, were all these words I had learned uh, trying to read Bavink and translating Bavink, and they were like, you know, the King's James Version or, or Shakespeare. And you know, so yeah, I got yeah. a lot of comments like, "You sound like my dead grandparents." Like, just just stop, you know. Oh like, wow. Can I just wow. speak English to you? So. In the end, I didn't really learn uh, how to speak it. Uh, it is one of my my goals. I'd love to get into some sort of like uh, like Dutch immersion class or something here, just to really pick pick it up on that sort of level. Yeah. Well, um, 
to go back to this book real quick, just so so people know, like it's a great book. It's Herman Bovings, What Is Christianity? Um, in the the cover here, uh, it's a Hendrickson book. It's got the like Batman the animated series font from when we were kids. <laughs> do you have, have, do you are you familiar with that show? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's so, like um, just hit me. Like this is the Batman animated series. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. I think it's uh technically the Art Nuevo style. Okay. Um. I could have said that wrong, but it was a, a prominent kind of font style that was used uh, in Dutch society okay. at the turn of the 20th century. So that was kind of, it was a little bit of a homage to uh, the time period trying to draw upon the fonts, but it, it definitely does have connections to Batman. <laughs> That's awesome. I should have known that there's some reason for it. You guys always have reasons like the uh, philosophy of revelation book has, you know, this, uh, I don't know if it's abstract art, but it's like the the Dutch mm-hmm. art of the time where they're trying to get at like the universals and stuff. And it's just beautiful. I think it's beautiful. Some people think it's just shapes, yeah. but yeah, yeah. there's yeah, always yeah, that reasons. Was, that was Mondrian and Mondrian has like a kind of a weird connection to Dutch neo-Calvinism and that he really, his earlier stuff has a ton of organicism in it. You know, he's drawing a lot of uh, trees and that sort of stuff. And then his later stuff gets in this abstract direction, but he had a, a connection I think is... I don't want to misspeak. I think his father was um, a neo-Calvinist minister, okay. um, but that could be totally wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was I was trying to be pretty intentional with the cover, um, drawing upon that font. And then a lot of Bobbing's, uh books, the Dutch editions of them do have some sort of floral on them. So that that too oh. was, was trying to connect to. Yeah. Um, is it? A, I mean, it looks like a tulip, but that, I mean, is it a it tulip? Or is, okay. Yeah. I don't yeah, it probably is. It's gotta um, be. Gotcha, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, dude, so there's a couple of things we've been throwing around that people won't know, but I think are really important. Um, I'm sorry to do it to you, but the the organic motif stuff, you said maybe mm-hmm. maybe that's been played too hard. Um, mm-hmm. I love that though. Like, can you can mm-hmm. you help us with it? We I had James on to talk about it before and you know, Gray, but yeah, but if in case people haven't watched those. Yeah, certainly. Um, so the the organic motif. Uh, is this really philosophical uh, idea that that Bavink appeals to in his most constructive movements. And so organicism itself is sort of this romantic concept. Uh, Bavink reuses it or retools it towards reformed ends. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's it means unity and diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's unity precedes diversity. Uh, there's some sort of common idea that is is driving the organism. And then it has a, a telos that is both organic and uh, mechanical. Hmm. Might be missing one, but uh, so the, the church is a great example of uh, the or- organicism, right? You have all these uh, people in a church, and that's the organic portion of a church, right? There have different giftings, so they can be both unified in their common idea of the church service or uh, being drawn along by the Holy Spirit. Um, but they're all different, right? They're diverse. There's there's yeah. a or there's an organicism to it, right? And then they have a mechanical uh, side of it, which is the institution with with elders and the administration of the word, um, the word and sacrament. And so you have both mechanical and organicism, and these get pulled along towards their their telos, uh, which is the the kingdom of God or the 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 body of Christ. Um, and so they have both this organic and mechanical end. Um, but this organicism uh yeah bobbing really draws upon it uh in his most constructive movements or draws upon it when he's trying to sort of blend uh contrasting thinkers in a, a constructive way yeah um so. well and that fits with like his his um polymath uh type uh feel what did what was the i, I can't remember the word that you said james called him like this uh, so center. james calls him a, a polymath um, in my own writing, I, I'm starting to refer to him as a centrifugal or centripetal scholar, um, meaning uh, kind of he works both inside and out. Right. He's he's an individual who uh, comes to an issue with his own personality, his own kind of set of ideas. And he's trying to organize the world. But yet the world is also working upon him as he's trying yeah. to organize them. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and that's I love really, that. Yeah. Well, well go, go ahead here, Greg. And that's uh, that's really drawn from. Uh, he has a, a a book on like child development and uh, what what okay. it looks like to raise kids, 
And in, in a small section of that book, when he's talking about psychology, he talks about all humans as being centrifugal and centripetal. And so, uh, so I'm really mm -hmm. kind of tipping my hat to, uh, to this little book of his. I love which that. I think, I think James is actually translating it. And, uh, and if James listens to this, maybe it can be like a slight prod to, to pick it back up and continue. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> I'm sure he will. He's the man. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, the, the organic motif I love and, and uh, James kind of set the uh, the dictum down and a lot of you guys will, will pick that up in, in your books, but it's like Trinity ad intra leads to or ne I don't think anyone has said necessitates yet, but it leads to or, you know, brings forth or puts forward uh, organism ad ad extra. So Trinity ad mm -hmm. intra leads to organism ad extra and this organism of unity and diversity. Uh, out in the world, not uniformity. So uh, not everything looks exact, exactly one, but but God makes different things uh, to be different, but also to to be unified and and to uh, it. We see it in the church. Once we once I read his book, uh, Trinity and Organism, I saw it everywhere. It's like on our coins, mm -hmm. e pluribus unum, and stuff. You know, it's it's all over the place, and it's beautiful, yeah. and it's it's wonderful way to to look at the world. But it's so cool that like that is part of who Bob Inc. is and what he does. And you can see him as this. He's a dogmatician. And yet he's writing on mm -hmm. all these different things because he's like, that's what a dogmatician should do. If I'm thinking yeah. about God, I should think about all of his world through that mm -hmm. lens. Mm -hmm. um, that The word dogmatician has, I don't know, in the 90s. Oh, I haven't been alive that long. But I remember in the 90s, being like, <laughs> dog, dogma was really bad. Right. And there was I think right. there was a. Yeah. A movie with like Jane Silent Bob or something about dogma. And I just remember dogma mm -hmm. being bad. Right. So the word dogmatics and dogmatician is like super old school. And now we say systematic theology. And when I, if I tell people I studied systematic theology, usually they go, Ooh, wow. I'm like, no, you won't like it if I tell you what it is. It just <laughs> sounds cool. What's the difference? Like, is, is there an actual difference between uh, dog dogmatics and systematic theology? Is Was, was Bavink just a systematic theologian under different terminology back in the day? Uh, yes, to some degree. Uh, so within this concept of the, the theological encyclopedia, uh, which has, you know, some sort of, uh, organic background to it, uh, he's trying to organize the various disciplines and then within theology. So theology has its own encyclopedia, the theological encyclopedia. Mm. Uh, it's this attempt to organize the various disciplines within theology. Right. And so he saw, uh, really what he thought was the church historically split into four uh, distinctions, which was uh, exegetical, uh, systematic, um, historical, and then practical. And okay. uh, and he was really trying to combat uh, this, this movement within theology, which had switched to a threefold uh, partition, uh, which is because of Schleiermacher, which I think was philosophical, practical, and historical. I may have uh, misremembered that. So he really saw his encyclopedia as an attempt to kind of confront Schleiermacher and reshape theological curriculum, you might say. Okay. And so within the theological encyclopedia underneath this, this fourfold banner, uh, he really, across his writing, he switches back and forth between calling the systematic one uh, dogmatics or systematics. Um, okay. I think when he's being most consistent, he's calling it systematics uh kind of the banner itself and then dogmatics is under that with dogmatics ethics i think apologetics is there eclectics is there and um maybe aesthetics as well um okay but so i take dogmatics and in, in, in bobbing's corpus as this uh this attempt to do uh ecclesially oriented theology uh, that is attempting to build uh doctrines i take systematic in his corpus to be a little bit broader than that, uh, to be kind of still system building, uh, but not this attempt at, uh, precisely burrowing into specific things. Hmm. Okay. That's, no, that's really helpful. What, so, um, I forgot the fourfold that you mentioned. Does, did, did he have, was one of the four, uh, philosophical theology or did he subsume that under, under a different one? Uh, so s strangely or interestingly, uh, he, he doesn't put, philosophy underneath one of these banners uh so okay. it was exegetical uh systematic historical and practical okay uh, but he actually saw uh the encyclopedia itself as philosophy uh okay. so at the turn of in the you know the 
uh, the 19th century, 20th century, you had this, uh, this movement within philosophy where philosophy really didn't belong to some degree in the university curriculum. People were kind of wondering, you know, where, where, what do we do with this? You know, where does it belong? Uh, I think, um, I want to say Fred Beiser uh, says something like it's a, it's a mother hen with, without her chicklets. Like she does, she doesn't really huh. know what she's doing. You know, like what, what am I meant to be doing? And you have all these conversations kind of springing up around that. So stuff like Wissenschaft, uh, worldview, yeah. and encyclopedia were all attempts to kind of answer the question, like wh where does philosophy belong in the university curriculum? And so Bob Inc. really puts out there that encyclopedia, this organizing of the sciences, is an attempt to do kind of philosophy. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about that's so interesting. Like uh, it's such an interesting historical point because people will we'll talk about uh worldview and today it's like really it's really um it shows how enlightened you are if you hate on the word worldview <laughs> you know it shows you like oh you know we're all done with that like you know relax dude it's a great concept i like to go with the with the uh Bavink mafia and say world and life view you know because you yeah. I, I, I do like that one but um but it's really fascinating to think that word cropped up vision chef because philosophy didn't fit and that's what they were trying to get at and i i actually i really like that for uh, a helpful understanding of what philosophy is is seeing it as mm -hmm. a, a systematic world uh, and life study just say right. so in that way it was a, a kind of a science of the sciences or a, a universal yeah. wissenschaft which is really bobbing it's kind of a subversive move of, of placing theology in that position or the theological encyclopedia right yeah that that a man's worldly philosophy isn't what is meant to orient him but really his his theology is meant to orient him yeah. yeah, man, that's so good. Um, <clears throat> so he he's one one more time on on the dogmatic uh, versus systematic distinction. So I I think of like Bob Inc. Um, a lot of people will say you know he's like uh, the foremost reformed dogmatician. Um, and today I I think like who's the who's the best systematic theologian? And that's tough, I know, but. I work with Van Hooser, so I'm like, well, it's Kevin Van Hooser. <laughs> but he wouldn't rightly be called a dogmatician because he's not he's not like a dog, he's not like a systematic theologian of a certain denomination. Uh, mm -hmm. sorry, Van Hoos, if I'm calling you out or anything, but like I, I'm pretty sure he goes to Anglican church right now, but he is in the PCA. So he's not like the PCA's dogmatician or anything. So I don't right. when I think of the two, I think of it like that. That like this is like a systematic theologian of this denomination setting forth their uh systematic theology or dogma in a systematic way just what, what do you make mm -hmm. of that that kind of thought hmm. so i i think if i'm tracking you i might see it slightly different and that okay. i see systematic theology as a, a broader enterprise yeah uh, so i think van hooser would fit into a systematician yep. whereas a a dogmatician is working within a particular uh, kind of ecclesial branch or ecclesial uh, tradition that he's trying to consciously draw from. Yeah. Um, so we might say Bob Inc.'s reform dogmatics are the work of a dogmatician, uh, but maybe the the other translation that uh, Cameron Clausing and I did, Guidebook for Instruction in the Christian Religion, uh, that probably more naturally falls into systematic theology and that it's mm -hmm. a, a kind of a broader endeavor. He's not really trying to put forth a, a particular tradition uh, I mean, he is still putting forth uh, reformed theology in a way, right? Um, right. Uh, but it's a, a really a broader undertaking. <clears throat> okay. Would you make I the can, same? I can flash the book for that. Yeah, there we go. Another one, man. <laughs> Beautiful. Love that. Wait, w one more time. What's the title of that one? A guidebook for instruction in the Christian religion. Okay. Um, and actually, how, how does... uh, yeah, go ahead. Sort of a, a subtle. Uh, homage to Calvin in that the, the the title of Calvin's Institutes in the Dutch and the Dutch title of this, uh, I think there's only one word difference uh, being huh. the first. So they're, they're, they're very close. He's kind of uh, just letting you know that this is sort of still Calvinist. <laughs> nice. Um, how does that one, I want to jump back. Uh, well, okay, let me think. How does guidebook compare to uh, like wonderful works compared to uh, reformed dogmatics? Could we said, you know, reformed dogmatics would be a work of of Dutch, you know, dogma is wonderful works. Just, is that the same thing? Or would you say that's more of a systematic and that it's not as strictly reformed? Um, I might still say that that one is uh, a dogmatic work in that the, the subtitle for that 
um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna remember the exact uh, wording, but it's something along the lines of um, uh, according to the Reformed Confessions or, or working okay. out the Reformed Confessions. Yeah, that um, makes sense then. So it's uh, it's yeah still kind of in this this particular vein or tradition. Um, and in terms of like the relationship between the three, uh, reform dogmatics is really the work uh, for the academic, for the scholar. Uh, I remember my first time of reading reform dogmatics, uh, volume one was giving me such a big headache. Like I, <laughs> uh, no, one, to... no one should start with volume one, probably. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. That's, that's my advice to people now is always start with volume two. Um, yeah. but it's, it's so philosophical. It's so, uh, I mean, really focused on his epistemology. And, and so it's this really academic tome. Yeah. Wonderful Works of God is sort of meant for like the, the college aged or college graduate uh, lay professional who has some sort of education and uh, is really willing to work through the, the richness of the Reformed tradition, um, but may not have all the, the scholarly tools to be able to refer to the Latin or the Greek or to kind of understand why it's important that, you know, Schleiermacher would be referenced or why it would be important that, you know, um, I don't know troll should be referenced, you know, just so these, yeah. these, just these various figures who aren't really Im important for the nitty gritty of, of church life. And then guidebook, uh, which has uh, some significant overlap with wonderful works of God, uh, is really for that next level down, really that that high school graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, he intended it to be a part of like high school gymnasium curriculums in their kind of religion courses. Um, so it's really intended for that, the, the high schooler. Um, today, I, I think it really works well uh, for a college day student or a high schooler um, who just looks at the reform dogmatics or looks at the wonderful works of God and thinks that thing is huge. <laughs> There's hmm. no way I'm going to truck through that. Um, cause it's, it's significantly shorter being like 225 pages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's significant kind of word for word overlap between the two. Uh, so if you really like the wonderful works of God, um, you know, maybe it's, it's too long or you're kind of getting lost in some of like the biblical theology sections. Uh, the guidebook is kind of perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's huge. I I, uh, I started with volume two because Van Hooser assigned it in one of his theology courses, and it was like it was like theology one that we were going through this, and mm -hmm. uh, I loved it because I had studied a bunch of theology coming into it. So I would be in Greek and just like tearing my hair out, super upset, like I hate Greek, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the Chinese students were just killing Greek. They were so good and they were learning it in English, like their third right. or fourth language. They were learning Greek yep. and they were just, just language rock stars. Then we get into Van Hooser's class and they'd be like, this is so hard. I'm like, yeah, finally now I don't, have to be. <laughs> but it, it, it right. was so good. Mm -hmm. And I look back on like pro, prolegomena and I'm like, this is like his philosophy type stuff. This is yep. volume one's pro, prolegomena. And a lot of times we, as Americans skip that stuff. Cause we're like very pragmatic mm -hmm. type folks. And we're like, nah, I don't care about the foundations of it. Just tell me what, what to believe. Right. Um, so, so I, I love the dogmatic. So, so helpful. I, I love that you have like this, the, the system for it uh, of like, you know, reform dogmatics up top and then wonderful works. Where, uh, where does, what does Christianity fit in then? Would that be like below guidebook or next to it alongside of it? I think it probably properly belongs alongside of it, um, but it, there's really a different audience in mind, right? Guidebook is is for someone who probably does have sort of Christian background or Christian belief. Yeah. When Bob Inc. wrote "What Is Christianity" or uh, the first essay in there, because there's there's two essays, um, Christianity, the first essay, uh, it was really to take part um, in this series in, in in Dutch society that was being published called "The Great Religions." And so he wrote this intending it kind of for the, the general Dutch public to have some sort of understanding about what Christianity is, what makes it distinct from the other religions, you know, in sort of a, a persuasive putting forth of, of Christianity. At the same time, uh, it's kind of theologically taking part in a discussion that's happening at the time over the essence of Christianity. Uh, so you had folks like Feuerbach and Harnack all kind of putting forth uh, or, or Herman Kramer, these, these kind of uh, articulations of what Christianity is at, at its kind of kernel or its essence. And so he's also kind of partaking, excuse me, <coughs> in this uh, 
other discussion too. Yeah, I caught that it may be in your forward or in your in your intro. And I thought that was really interesting. Another really fascinating historical point that like at this time people were looking for that kernel type stuff. Mm-hmm. And I I just it's hard for me not to just fanboy over over Bobbing because I love who he is and what he does, but this is the guy who can write reform dogmatics and then a bunch of essays on uh, all sorts of stuff, ethical, ethical issues and such, as well as being like involved in like papers, like uh, newspapers and stuff like that. And being uh, uh, Kuiper's theological henchman and like he could do all this stuff. But then he was also jumping in on this. And instead of saying this kernel stuff is not religious, this finding the kernel, the essence of Christianity. No, no, no. What you need is the dogmatics. Read my whole thing. He's like, I'll do that, too. I'll jump in on that project as well as making my own dogmatics, as well as doing this, as well as teaching at every level. That's what I love. I want more people like that, you know, who aren't just (laughs) fighting over. No, don't make it too simple or don't make it too heady. Like, let's do it all. Every level. Let's hit them all. Yeah, it's it's really quite incredible. Uh, And and, and partially uh, he is a man of his time period in that Mm. the proliferation of knowledge had not become so overly specialized that he really was able to yeah. dip his feet in all these various um, kind of industries or academic uh, inquiries like like pedagogy had not yeah. really come along much in Dutch society. So he was able to get into it uh, really at the, the ground roots and participate in it and make his, his voice heard there, uh, yeah. partially because it was an underdeveloped discipline, right? At, yeah. at this point, um, and this is even partially the role of the theological encyclopedia, sorry to, to keep banging that drum, oh, uh, but the, the theological encyclopedia in, in Dutch uh, theological curriculum was meant to be kind of part and parcel of this uh, almost like manual tradition uh, in that you would learn kind of what is the scope of your field at the beginning of your studies. And then you would kind of delve into each one of these, right? You would take your class with Van Hooser and you take your class with, uh, is, is Kelly also at Ted's? I don't know. I didn't have Kelly. Maybe. Okay. So you, you take Van Hoosier. You might also take uh, someone else at Ted's. And then you kind of get this this broader range of, of folks and their kind of knowledge. And then at the end of your studies, you were meant to return to the theological encyclopedia again and kind of reorganize it and see, okay, that's how mm-hmm. actually how Van Hooser's class connects with the, the bioethics class that I'm taking. Yeah. Um, and so the... Um, getting lost in my own thoughts uh encyclopedia um uh he was he was in on the base level or the ground level a lot of the stuff sciences were at a kind of a a manageable point uh that he could really dip his toes into uh all these different ventures and of of course he's brilliant right there's we don't want to discount that at all uh but i think it'd be much more difficult for uh an individual today uh to really do that i mean of course you have uh, various Christian intellectuals who, you know, write the column for the local newspaper are, you know, participating in their church life, then also producing popular level books and then, you know, heady tomes. But uh, they are kind of few and far between because it is such a, a difficult task to balance all of that. Um, so it's yeah. probably nice that uh, the crew in, in uh, Edinburgh is kind of dividing and conquering Bob Inc. That way none of us have to uh, take on the task of knowing all of him in that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, so going on with that, with the uh, encyclopedia and with with his worldview stuff and even like, you know, philosophy of revelation is another deep one, just like thick uh, philosophy. And it's really it's an amazing book. Would you do you think he's like, is he rightly called a philosopher theologian? Is he, you know, does, does that work? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, uh, I know James is is working on. Uh, an essay to some degree, but he's he presented at the Davenin Institute a while back yeah. about Bob Inc. as a philosopher. Uh, and really interestingly, he kind of pointed out how, uh, you know, if you look through Dutch newspapers about how Bob Inc. was presented or written about, it was primarily uh, either as a, a theologian or, or a, a philosopher or a theologian philosopher or a Christian wow. philosopher. And so he really was presented as a, a philosopher to Dutch society, which is was really interesting. And and James points out uh, some of his historical uh, mentors, Andre and Stekate, and how he was really a kind of a philosophically driven figure and how Bobnik was really impressed with him. 
uh, I think in my my own work, it really stands out to me. Uh, he's got this speech uh, that he wrote and or, or uh, he presented it probably to some sort of YMCA type group uh, on predestination in 1918. And he's kind of playing with the the organic motif or the idea of the one and the many, yeah. uh, right? Unity and diversity. And he kind of points out how, you know, there's a group of philosophers who want you to be uh, concentrated on the one or some sort of monad. And then there's another group of philosophers who uh, want you to be concentrated on the diversity of everything, right? That nothing can really be held together. Uh, and he says that really uh, it's, it's Christianity that holds those two together. Uh, with their belief in a triune God. And yeah. uh, and so that that work to me was like, wow, like he's like citing all these philosophers uh, and it's really him trying to present a, a Christian philosophy. And then when he starts kind of hashing out uh, this uh, constructive or, or slightly different uh, approach to predestination than he does in the dogmatics, uh, he primarily draws upon Hegel and Schopenhauer as examples of like uh, how there's remnants or, or some sort of acknowledgement of these truths in the philosophers that we can really kind of draw upon so it was mm. uh, Hegel's idea of reason as being some sort of divine counsel behind uh, election and then Schopenhauer's uh, will so that this this divine counsel does have a will that it is executing mm. um, but, but to me that was just a, a really fascinating little uh, uh, lecture or, or, or short speech that he gave um, because he's really, I don't know, uh, demonstrating his philosophical chops. Uh, yeah. Probably to a, you know, a group of men our age who are just kind of interested in theology. I love that. Well, <clears throat> um, I hate to make you like pull back on on uh, some some of your older work, but if and you know, feel free to just punt on it. But with the organic motif, um, I know that people want to the the Bavink Mafia wants to resist um putting organism like in god it's it's like well look um trinity ad intra you know three persons and, and one god that mm -hmm. leads to the organic motif outside but but we don't necessarily like want to say that god the organic motif like stretches back into god i just wonder right. um because van til pushes on the the trinity as a solution to the problem of one and many like often mm -hmm. and all the van mm -hmm. have to go like well like, look at this problem with the one and many. We've never solved it. And, and philosophers today are like, I don't care. What are you talking about? And like, no, no, it's still a problem. And you, and you, so you have to do all this work to, like, motivate the problem of the one and many and then say how the Trinity solves it. Um, right. When it comes to, like, Bob Inc.'s understanding of simplicity, if you still can pull back on that, um, mm -hmm. how did how did that, how did Bob Inc., what was his simplicity like? Um, did it mess with, like, the doctrine of the Trinity? Was he still able to have, like, a... Van Til calls it an equal ultimacy between unity and diversity in the Godhead. Is that something yeah. that Bob Inc. would agree with too, or what do you think? Um, so I'm not, I'm not, sh I'm assuming that he'd probably agree with Van Til and maybe, you know, pick over terms. Uh, that, that, uh, that THM project was primarily interested in looking at uh, Bob Inc.'s eclectic use of sources in relation okay. to divine simplicity. Yeah. Uh, and this was, kind of part and parcel with this, I was seeing this growing trend within Bobbing studies of the organic motif and wanting to point back to uh, the Trinity as it's, uh, you know, uh, kind of archetype. Uh, and in the back of my head, I was kind of saying, well, does the simplicity get in the way of this? Yeah. And, uh, I, and I don't think it does. Uh, okay. I think the way that uh, Bobbing talks about simplicity is it's really this, this richness or this fecundity or a multitude to, uh, plenitude to the divine life. Uh, and so I kind of saw out of that, um, that you couldn't really contrast maybe the, um, organicism or the richness of organic life, um, with simplicity. Uh, but it is a, a very, uh, orthodox, uh, reading of simplicity. He's not really doing much that's, uh, innovative there. He, he pushes back a little bit against, uh, Schleiermacher, because uh, Schleiermacher didn't love simplicity. Yeah. Um, he draws a bit on Aquinas, uh, which was kind of the discussion at the time in Bobbing studies, at least, uh, was was how how Thomistic was Bobbing. Yeah. Um, and my claim of the thesis was that uh, we can't really call Bobbing's doctrine of divine simplicity uh, Thomistic because uh, Thomas is just one source among many that he's he's really drawing upon. Yeah. I, I love that point. I think that's really important because a lot of there's like, man, there are so many, 
subdivisions in theology and then in like Calvinistic circles or neo Calvin, like it all like gets all bifurcated. And a lot of these folks are like, I hate Van Til. I love Bavink. And I think all reformed people should be Thomists. And you're like, well, wait, <laughs> but Bavink wasn't a Thomist. Like, yeah, he's a, he a collective, but you could pull for, you could look at him and read him only using Thomas and be like, yeah, here you go. But he pulls a lot from Schleiermacher who you guys would like, throw up if right. you saw him do that you know and so <laughs> um I, I i love that about him and i love to push back on that when people are like i hate i hate van Til. we should probably tell him like well do you like bobbing love bobbing okay well you right. know van Til's been pulling a lot from bobbing so take it easy how right. yeah how can we how can we be like bobbing today and and be like eclectic you know because mm -hmm. a lot of people be like yeah i love that about him but i only read his dogmatics and he said what he said <laughs> is the final word right I mean, I, I think it requires you reading beyond your tradition uh, yeah. and, and being uh, kind of comfortable with being posed with with problems that maybe your tradition doesn't have uh, the right answer for yeah. or maybe the, the most robust answer for. Um, I mean, there's there there could be a, a troubling development, perhaps an appropriation of Bavink in thinking that Bavink has the kind of the corrective or the answer to every theological problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is kind of an unfair burden to put upon him. Um, like w one man can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to be careful in, in Bavinkian appropriation of, of being honest with, with Bavink's shortcomings. Um, but I think to, to be like Bavink and to uh, really draw upon all these eclectic sources, you really have to be reading people you disagree with and, and to some degree, I think probably reading sources that are are dead or older. Um, uh, not saying that we can't learn from you know Van Hooser's work, and he's Van Hooser still you know active and writing today. Yeah. Uh, but there is something in taking part in a, a conversation that is older than you, and, and kind yeah. of recognizing, okay, here are the actual players of it, and here here's here's what's shaping the discussion that we're having today. Yeah. That's and really then helpful. probably just in, in general. Uh, reading people ironically and not uh, uh, with the intention of tearing them down. Um, I know in Edinburgh, I did this um, systematic theology reading group with uh, Joshua Ralston and, and David Ferguson. Uh, David since moved on to Cambridge, but they were both professors uh, in uh, Edinburgh. And they had us read all these various sorts, but sources, but one of them um was that we read through Schleiermacher's The Christian Faith. And yeah. uh, and I I kind of, at the start of it, I was like, oh, man, like, like I'm just going to grit my teeth and like get through this. Like, it's going to be fine. Like, uh, and then by the end of it, I was, I was really glad that I had kind of taken Schleiermacher seriously uh, and not just, okay, like how can I learn to tear him down? Uh, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what, what can I actually learn from him? Um, and he, he, he has definitely shaped then in the end uh, some of my conclusions on, on Bob Inc. and Bob Inc.'s thinking uh, in my dissertation. Um, but it was really just uh, kind of a helpful exercise. And, you know, Ralston and, and Ferguson were, were there to kind of guide and help us understand and keep away from uh, misreadings. Um, but it was such, such a fruitful exercise to do that. So I would definitely commend to others you know if, if you're going to try to be like bob Inc., you need to read things that uh, maybe make you uncomfortable and you know perhaps it's best to read those in you know with a buddy or with, with a group of people uh to really kind of help you to synthesize their thought and and see what others might see as uh inventive or interesting about those figures yeah i think that's that's such a good point and yeah i i i feel it myself too like i know like why, why would I want to read Schleiermacher when I could read Bavink? It's like, why would I waste my time? Because I know Bavink's yeah. already right. And it's like, well, how do you know that if you haven't read? And I, I've read Schleiermacher and I, I didn't have as good of an experience as you. But it wasn't <laughs> like I super discreet. It was just like, I don't really right. understand what you're saying more. And I only had a limited time to read it uh, in this classics course. Yeah. But um, when, when you think about like the Dutch Reformed theology of Herman Bavink, is there a denomination that is his theological error today or is there what or can we not even point to one uh so i probably don't know enough about uh modern uh uh dutch fragmentation in um 
we might call them denominations, uh, to know which one might associate with bobbing the closest. But uh, one of the maybe sad, sad things about um, Dutch culture or Dutch polity is that there is a proclivity to divide in yeah. their... Um, I really don't want to call them denominations because that's not really what they are. Um, but so there, there are a few divisions after Bobbing's death. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly which one we would point to in, in, in Dutch culture. I know that the CRNC, CR, CRCNA in America has some yeah. sort of uh, Dutch heritage. But but is it like that's all of like the reform folks? Not all. I can't. I got to be so careful. Um, you expect, like I read reform dogmatics, like on my own in like a non-denominational church. Mm -hmm. And then I'd go and visit like a Dutch, uh, or not a Dutch, like a reform church and be like, we're going to hear Bob Inc. this Sunday. And it's mm -hmm. not, you know, cause it, people were just all different. And a lot of people reverence the name, uh, Kuiper or Bob Inc. But there's not like Bob Inc. Uh, there's not like a stream. I, I don't think maybe there is, but I know like mm -hmm. even in like Presbyterians, like some are like very much like, let's cool. Let's, let's do it. Like Westminster, Philadelphia is like, yeah, cool. Because he agrees with Van Til. So whoever agrees with Van Til is cool. <laughs> even though, you know, Van Til is downstream of buffing. Uh, right. And then other places, other Presbyterian churches are like, mm, we don't like the Dutch theology that came in. We, we like mm -hmm. the American theology. Um, and we're upset that he did it. We're, like Warfield and Bobbing weren't the same people, and we would rather right. follow Warfield. So it's just frustrating. Um, I want to be eclectic, man. I and I kind of am forced mm -hmm. to be because I'm not like uh, strictly reform. I don't believe in like infant baptism, so like I have to be right. eclectic because everyone's like, "Well, you're mm -hmm. wrong," and no one would like you in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a another one would be. Um, <clears throat> Bob Inc. was at this unique time, like you said, where he was able to get in on the ground level of a lot of things. But he's also, yeah, he was like a public theologian, public philosopher. People were writing about him in papers. Right. Is there anyone like that today? Can you think of like, is there a modern uh, a Bob Inc.? Are you going to say Tim Keller? You guys always, <laughs> you guys always say Tim Keller. Yeah, we, we do bang that drum. Um, I mean, uh Maybe maybe in the interest of of answering it differently, um, you can say Tim Keller if it's if that if that's who it is. But I think when I was uh, when I was really doing uh, my reading of Bob Inc. in seminary um, and really you know trying to imbibe him, uh, one of the things I really took for granted was that uh, Adonis Vidu, a, a professor up there, uh, really approach theology in a manner that was uh, symbiotic in some way to Bob Inc. And that he was mm. a very ironic thinker, uh, someone uh, interested in uh, exploring the questions of today, but wanting to draw on the resources of the past. Um, when I think of, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the guy, but he wrote um, uh a book that referenced Bob Inc. Uh, his kind of presence in the classroom as this very serious uh, theologian, but you would get him outside of the classroom or even before class started, like he was very friendly and willing to huh. engage with you in all these theological discussions. Uh, and in, to me, it just all reminded me of Adonis Vidu. Hmm. Um, so, so maybe even though Adonis is outside the uh, specifically reformed uh, Presbyterian tradition, Maybe he would call himself a Reformed Baptist, but I'm, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if he would. Um, but just his approach to theological questions and his interest in, in doing serious uh, theological work, uh, I think, reminds me a lot of Bob Inc. Uh, even if he's not um, necessarily, you know, writing newspaper articles or writing things on pedagogy and uh, ethics, I think just his kind of approach to theology uh, okay. really, at least. It shaped me so much when I was at Gordon Conwell, um, and Adonis is very early in his career, so who knows what he could write in the next uh, right. thirty years? But yeah. Um, all right, so I, I wanted to, to finish with like <clears throat> taking taking the mantle, like taking Bobbing's mantle. Like mm, you probably we probably shouldn't like aspire to his level of. Uh, influence in culture. I don't know. It, it depends on how Kuyperian you are, right? It, um, <laughs> but it's kind of weird, man. I, I've been talking about this with people. It's kind of weird to like 
I'm going to be a Christian influencer on TikTok. Like I put stuff on TikTok, so I'm sorry, everyone. But like, I'm trying to grow this show. You know, I, I, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird for a Christian to be like, I want to be famous. I want to be popular. I want to be influential. Um, Mm -hmm. You could slap on for the, for Christ in his kingdom. And and if if you're slapping it on, then it's weird. If you're like accidentally (laughs) famous, cool. Praise God. Mm -hmm. But um, when it comes to like actually taking his ideas and running them forward, um, mm-hmm. is that something that you guys, the, the Bob Inc. Mafia is, is looking to do, or are you guys like getting it, getting it clear? Like, here's what Bob Inc. said here. We got to translate a bunch of his stuff. This was one, like I had to give a criticism of Gray's book, uh, God and mm-hmm. knowledge because I wrote a, uh, review for it for Trinity Journal. So like, I had to say something and I was just like, Hey, at the end, I don't know if I'm supposed to be a Bob Inkian epistemologist or not, you know? Right. Um, mm-hmm. But Bob has got a lot of these ideas, especially Christian worldview and uh, philosophy of revelation, where I'm like, I would love to run with this. Is there any way to actually like do that and like update it? And, you know, without being like slavishly uh, idolatrous of him, can you like mm-hmm. take his ideas and, and update them and, or bring them into public public uh, conversation by updating the language or something like what do you make of that? Yeah, I, th- I think that's very possible. Um I think one maybe detail to note is maybe the uh, the different approaches to Bavink across continents, and that yeah. uh, like in the Netherlands, they, they all know who Bavink is theologically, or at least if they're in theological circles. Uh, if, if you ask someone on the street, they they probably wouldn't. Um, they might know that their child attends uh, elementary school on Bavink Street, uh, but they wouldn't know oh, who wow. Bavink is. Okay. Um, and in, in Dutch theology, kind of the, the remnants of, of Bob Inc. remains, or some of his influence remains, uh, you know, with uh, Van der Kooy or De Brink and, and Van den Belt, uh, although some of those are more consciously drawing on uh, Bob Inc. now, Step and Pass. Um, but they're really doing their own constructive projects. They're not explicitly saying, all right, we're, we're neo-Calvinists or we're neo Bavinkians or neo Kuyperians. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in American appropriations of Bob Inc., uh, it's really still in its infancy. Uh, so what you have right now is mostly folks saying, no, well, well, Bob Inc. didn't say that he said this, you know, we shouldn't understand Bob Inc. like this. We should understand him like that. Um, I'll be really interested to see what bobbing studies looks like, you know, two decades on when, yeah. uh, when all these guys who are doing uh, work that's kind of framing out neo Calvinism or framing out uh, bobbing's thought uh, when they begin to develop their own kind of theological constructive voice, because I think at that point they will need to uh, draw on more either modern sources or uh, language that is more appropriate for our culture uh, and this is, I mean, it's part of, um, I don't know if you've read Bruce Pass uh, and his dissertation on Bob Inc. Oh. Um, his, his final chapter in there, he kind of gets into how John Webster was drawing upon Bob Inc. in his later work and uh, how that was really an, an interesting um, uh, way to show Bob Inc.'s kind of influence in, the, in theology that had really gone, gotten to the level that even John Webster was, was reading him and thinking about him. Wow. Um, but then also uh, the need, uh, uh, Pass suggests, the need to actually do an organic lobotomy on Bob Inc.'s thinking, meaning organicism is, uh, as a concept is helpful, uh, but maybe that language and all the philosophical baggage that might come with it from yeah. romanticism, uh, that it would be just better if we kind of left it where it is. And so mm. he kind of puts out this charge, like in order for Bob Inc. retrieval to uh, kind of grow outside of its garden, uh, we need to lose the organicism. And that's a, that's a really provocative suggestion. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it yet. <laughs> I'm still wrestling yeah. with, uh, you know, as I think about doing my own theological work or, or lecturing or, you know, working on second projects, like well, what, what would it mean to actually lose organicism? You know, what, what bullet am I biting, um, by accepting it, you know? And so, uh, I think that those kind of questions still lie on the table for uh, Bavinkian retrieval. Um, yeah, you know. So, so I, I, th- think- I think you see it correctly that uh, right now it's a lot of uh, kind of uh, cleaning the hedges and, and and making it clear what Bavink actually thought, and and less so constructive 
theological voices. Um, but I, I'm really interested to see uh, Gray and Corey's new book on, on neo-Calvinism or a theological yeah. introduction to neo-Calvinism, um, because I, I'm assuming that there will be some constructive suggestions. And then I think they, they also have a work uh, in progress with TNT Clark that kind of outlines uh, the potential for neo-Calvinist uh, constructive work. Um, so I, I think maybe, maybe we're right on the edge of it, of seeing uh, how can we move beyond Bob Inc., but but still be indebted to him. Yeah, I'm 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 really excited about that. Um, because I live in these two different worlds of like philosophy and theology, I'm I'm constantly having to learn how to navigate the two different like realms. So like when I when I was with uh, Van Hoos and reading Bob Inc., if you, I learned that if you can make your point by through quotes, like you don't even have to say any of your own words. You just quote, 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 mm -hmm. quote, stitch them together. And it shows like, look at how much I, I've read it. Look, I do know right. what I'm talking about. And that's very important in theology. And if I do mm -hmm. that in philosophy, they're like, what are you doing? Well, this isn't your stuff. Like, <laughs> why are you quoting so much? I don't, you can go a whole paper without any quotes and like, they'll hammer me for that. So um, there's like this tendency that I want. I want to say, look, here's who I'm in line with. I'm, this is cool. But then like the philosopher is like, okay, well that's, you know, appeal to authority. Great job. And it's like, okay, let's all this, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, but yeah. uh, like, can you hear uh, my dog barking right now? Yeah. No? It's no worries, man. Dogs, okay. dogs are cool. Dogs are all right. Um, um, the, well, the organicism I... drop, dropping that is similar. I think in like a Van, Vantillion circles, uh, Vantillion mm -hmm. apologetics, they, they have to say, well, it's a transcendental argument. It's like, well, can you explain that? What do you mean? Is that different or the same as what Kant meant? It's just transcendental. Right. You're like, well, dude, right. make if you can make the point without using that word, it might be better, especially if you're talking to someone on the street. And right. and so I think of a similar thing with like the word repent. And if I say like, hey, maybe drop repent from your evangelism uh, conversations with students in college, people get all bent out of shape and they're like, what? You're limiting the gospel. I'm like, no, just say, change your mind. Isn't that what the Greek means? Like in context, like meta, like just explain that. And you could say, Hey dude, you need to change your mind about who you are and your relationship to God. You need to change your mm -hmm. mind about who you think God is. You need to change your mind about, you know, thinking that you're independent from him. If you can convey that same point without saying repent and giving them an image of a guy with a sandwich board who says dirty dancers <laughs> are going to hell, you know, like right. it might be helpful. And that's supposed to be contextualization, but a lot of, my Christian friends get all bent out of shape that you're not being historical. You're mm -hmm. even though repent is not the Greek word that we read in the Greek new Testament, you know, it's, right. I don't know. So I'm all twisted up right now, but this. this is something that I'm actively wrestling. It sounds like you were a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe this is where like, uh, I don't know, a, a random philosopher like Wittgenstein might be uh, helpful. Yeah. You just triggered me, dude. You can't say Wittgenstein on here. Dang it. <laughs> no, I, I only did it just uh, just to get a rise out That's of you. That's good. That's good. Um, but yeah, I think there is definitely uh, a danger in, in theology just kind of to quote, you know, the right three people and, and make your point. Um, Augustine in, I want to say, book 11 or book 12 of the Trinity talks about kind of the reasons to study theology. And uh, the one negative example he gives is to kind of demonstrate what you know to people. And, mm. uh, and it's always, uh, a, a danger that, that we need to be aware of, right. Yeah. That, that we're not just kind of floating out what we know Yeah. in order Dang to Im impress others. That's very convicting, but, dude. That's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And I like that you did it by quoting, uh, yeah, very. Augustine yeah. in the in the chapter. Everyone That's needs good. to acknowledge that I'm I'm very right. smart and I've That's I've met August. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> I love that, well, Greg. Man, this is this has been so huge. One more time, uh, the book that that we didn't really talk a lot about. I'm sorry about that, but right. uh, it's it's Herman Bovink's What Is Christianity? It's a new translation by Greg, and you also have out. Um, I'm I misplaced the name of the the other book. That's right, Guidebook for Instruction in the Christian Religion. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that's coming out. The, the work on the encyclopedia stuff, like, is, is that, a, is that, are you doing something on that too? Uh, so that makes up probably two good chapters of my dissertation. Okay. Um, I do have an article out with the Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies uh, on, on some of uh, kind of the history of, of Bob Inc. walking through and tracing why he landed where he did on the theological encyclopedia. But uh, okay. as, as far as Anything beyond that, I think I'm still still working on it. Um, okay. I, I have 
mostly transcribed one of Bob Inks encyclopedias from the archives. Um, and I need to kind of touch that up before I translate it. But likewise, it's it's similar to uh, his ethics stuff in that it's not very polished. And okay. so I, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of market for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there will, there will be a market for it, but whether you want to yeah. do it or not, right? Because that's right. like we're... Yep. We're all, we all want the relics. Anything Bob Inks yep. touched, I will read. Um, <laughs> yeah, yep, so but... uh, maybe maybe someone's listening and they're like, hey, I like Herman Bob Inc. Or maybe they are just being introduced to him and they're going to start reading him and they want to go and study at Edinburgh with the mafia. Um, how, how would someone like go about doing that? Uh, so, I mean, if, if they, they know they like Bob Inc. Um, and want to get involved in, in Edinburgh, I would say... Um, you know, if, if you've done the the prerequisite programs, would that be a, a master's of theology or an MDiv or a THM uh, to really get in contact with James uh, okay. Eglinton? He's happy to uh, field emails and uh, uh, if you're expressing interest in his program. Uh, there's also, you know, Bruce Pass, I think, is accepting PhD students down in Australia. Hmm. Uh, I think. Cam Clausing might be soon at, at Christ College. And so uh, there are plenty of opportunities if if Edinburgh and being in, in British weather doesn't sound appealing to you, you could always go to Australia. Yeah. Um, but in terms of getting into Bavink, let's say, you know, you're an undergraduate student right now and you're interested in Reformed theology, you know that Bavink is sort of a, a buzz figure and you want to, to read him. Um, I really do think that uh, either of these two books that we've put out are a great place to start, uh, particularly Godbook for Instruction in the Christian Religion, um, because it's it's really Bobbing's most mature uh, systematic theology, and uh, and you really get an entrance uh, into his theological program in a nutshell, uh, mm -hmm. right? Without wading yet into the Reform dogmatics, and and if you get a, a handle of his of his guidebook, and you really have an, a good idea of what he's saying there. It'll really open so many uh, avenues of, of inquiry as you read his reform dogmatics. Um, but you really, really can't go wrong. Just uh, read as much of them as you can. And, and eventually you'll start to kind of uh, get the picture of them. But, you'll, you'll, if, if James is, uh, is anything of like, a, if you're anything like James, then you'll start to look like him as well. So the more you read, you'll yep. start to look more like Bobby. Yep. As well. Yeah, you're lucky. I, I just shaved off my beard and, and, <laughs> was getting too hot so well and that's part of it for me too man like he looks the part he looks like a, yep. he looks like a genius mm -hmm. he looks like moriarty or something like that but yep. in, a, in a good way <laughs> um well greg yeah. thanks so much for all your time man thanks for your work and thanks for the books looking forward to to more stuff from you got to get my hands on your dissertation you know after you're uh defended and all that stuff um is there so do, is there a place where people can find more of your stuff in your articles or anything like that uh, I don't. I don't have a website or anything. I have a Twitter. Uh, you guys, I, I mostly just joke about uh, the mundaneness of of life. I like to think of my Twitter as an extension of Seinfeld. That I'm really not doing anything there. It's a it's a Twitter <laughs> about nothing. Um, but I, I, I like am it. on Twitter. Uh, yeah. G underscore Parker underscore Junior. I usually do let people know if I've published something or if there are links to various things. Um, but Parker it was such an honor. I'm so glad to yeah, come man. on. Yeah, uh, even if you know, even if we didn't do our rendition of Hot Ones, um, just to <laughs> yeah, get yeah, out next time and, and, and catch up was right. uh, really a blessing and honor to me. So thank yeah. you so yeah. much. Till next time, brother, for sure. All right, guys, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>